without further ado, and it's with great pride I introduce Graham Hancock. Uh, tonight we'll talk about psychedelics and uh, civilization. And uh, the, the first point I'd, I'd like to make is um, I, psychedelics are very serious business. This is not, um, this is not for children. I, I think, I think there's, a, there's a correct distinction in our society between children and adults. And, and I, I think it's, it's right and proper to introduce children slowly as they mature to adult experiences and, and not, to, not to rush in that in that direction. The, the, the very young mind may not be ready for these experiences and we have responsibilities as, as adults to, to take that uh, seriously. However, uh, if we really do wish to protect our, our children from the dangers of drugs, then the present legal regime is the very last thing we need. The, the, the criminalization of quote-unquote uh, drug use um, is, is actually uh, empowering criminal gangs and is empowering the armed bureaucracies that already exist in our society and giving them the right to invade our privacy and break down, break down our doors. Um, if we really want to protect children from certain experiences, then uh, the best way actually is to legalize all, all drugs uh, and, and to surround them with, with wise advice and, and nurturing and loving care. Uh, rather than uh, to leave the situation as it is today. Um, at any rate, I'll not only talk about psychedelics, although mainly about psychedelics this evening, some other consciousness-altering agents as well. It's interesting when we look at the, the Say No to Drugs message uh, in our schools today that it wasn't always the case. Um, this is a school actually from uh, Dakhla Oasis in Lower Egypt, uh, and, and there are Greek writings on its walls which include positive references to drugs. Um, the, the context is a story from the Odyssey. Uh, Helen of Troy gives her guests a, a drug, most likely opium, um, that takes away grief and anger and brings forgetfulness of every ill. Uh, whoever in a bowl would not let fall a tear down his cheek in the course of that day at least. Whoever should drink this down when it is mixed in a bowl would not let fall a tear down his cheek in the course of that day at least. So there's a kind of positive context uh, being given here to consciousness-altering agents in a, in a school setting in, in Egypt more than 1,700 years ago. Uh, and um, I, I mean, in um, ancient Crete, uh, we had a poppy goddess. Um, there's, a, there's a gold signet ring from from Knossos that, that shows Demeter handing three uh, poppy heads to, to Persephone. Um, and uh, some great and revered works of art uh, owe their inspiration indeed to, to um, opium. Let's see if I can remember the first lines of the Coleridge poem, or some of the lines at any rate. In, in Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. However, Coleridge never completed that poem because the postman knocked at the door um, and uh, pulled him out of his visionary state uh, and by the time he went back to his chair he'd forgotten the whole thing. Uh, so we're left with, uh, with a fragment. Nevertheless, an inspiring fragment. Um, I don't like the title of Emberden's book, Narcotic Plants, because it doesn't only deal with narcotics, it, it, uh, it deals with psychedelics too. But uh, interestingly, um, Ancient Egypt began, we see Nefertiti uh, presenting uh, an opi opium poppy heads uh, to her husband, uh, Akhenaten. Well, I can't imagine Queen Elizabeth presenting opium poppy heads to Prince Philip, you know. Um, and <laughs> And then we have um, the reverence towards the blue water lily that is, that is shown in ancient Egypt. And you often see imagery of individuals, you know, enjoying the perfume of the blue water lily. Uh, but there's much more to it, much more to it than that. 
Um, and, and here we see uh, the datura flower uh, being beamed down um, in the, in, into the, the forehead of this, uh, of, of this lady here. So, so clearly these visionary substances were, were highly regarded in ancient Egypt and were used for visionary purposes. We need not be in doubt about that because um, traces of a, of a liquid extract from the blue water lily were, were found in uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, and the liquid extracts are, are only used for visionary purposes. And then we have the ancient uh, Egyptian tree of life. The ancient Egyptians had amazingly evolved and, and wonderful uh, spiritual ideas often expressed in symbolic terms. And here we see the pharaoh Seti uh, I and his name is being written on the tree of immortal life by the god Thoth, the wisdom god. But uh, my friend uh, Dennis McKenna, brother of the late great Terence McKenna, uh, Dennis is an ethnopharmacologist and he has identified this tree, the species, and this is Acacia nilotica. Uh, and it's a tree which is rich in DMT, in, in dimethyltryptamine. Now, it's a bit of an operation to get the DMT out of the bark. It involves some chemistry. Uh, and critics of this proposal have said that the ancient Egyptians would never have had the chemical knowledge uh, to extract DMT from the bark of the acacia, um, which of course is complete rubbish. Uh, because um, where do we get the word chemistry from? Uh, if not from the ancient name of ancient Egypt, Kemit, the black land, which the Arabs called Al-Kemit, from which we get alchemy and from which we get our word chemistry. Uh, I think the ancient Egyptians were quite capable of extracting DMT from Acacia nilotica, and therefore we can say that we know what the ancient Egyptians were smoking. <laughs> Interesting from Tutankhamun's tomb, uh, this is from the second shrine of Tutankhamun's tomb, and uh, interesting imagery here. So there's a star in the sky, and then there's rays of light or something coming down from that star, some influence, some radiance, and uh, entering the, the third eye of the initiate, as seen, as this, uh, seen in this image, is a very clear image of, of inspiration of some, of some kind. And the third eye, of course, is, um, is associated with the pineal gland. And I found this meme on the, on the internet, but it's interesting, really, that the eye of Horus and the, the pineal gland are so similar uh, in, in appearance. Um, and again, we you know, look at this, this scene here. And of course the argument is, uh, Rick Strassman's work at the University of New Mexico hasn't absolutely proved this yet. Uh, dimethyltryptamine DMT is an endogenous brain hormone uh, pr produced by all humans. We're all uh, illegal in this room. Um, <laughs> and uh, the evidence is accumulating that it is the pineal gland which is responsible for uh, the creation of DMT in the human body. The lungs are involved as well. It's a complicated story, but the pineal is certainly, certainly part of it. Um, if we go to uh, Bolivia, uh, to the Altiplano, looking down on the, um, city of the mysterious city of Tiwanaku, uh, you'll find some striking statuary there. Uh, these are called the Ponche and, and Bennett um, monoliths from Tiwanaku. Has anybody seen the show Ancient Aliens? A few of you have. It's a popular show in, in America out here. Um, Ancient Aliens likes to argue that these are ray guns. So these are aliens holding ray guns, okay? But the truth, I think, is even more uh, intriguing because actually what they're holding are snuff trays for an Adenanthera snuffs from the lower Amazon. Um, in fact, such stuff, stuff, stuff strays can still be found in, in, in the Amazon, and Dr. Manuel Torres has uh, identified these as um, snuff trays for the consumption of, essentially, a DMT snuff, uh, central to the culture of uh, Tiwanaku. And then Corral, um, this extraordinary uh, pyramid site about, oh, um, 40, 50 miles north of Lima, uh, was actually unknown 20 years ago. Uh, it's been excavated uh, in, in that time, and what emerged was the remnants of a gigantic urban civilization which built huge numbers of, of pyramids, which are uh, close to 5,000 years old. 
And uh, the initial reaction of archaeology was that this was one of the first city of the Americas, and um, like all cities, it must have been built up around warfare and, and intense centralized hierarchical organization. Often I find that we make the mistake of uh, v viewing the past as a, a mirror ra rather than a window, and we, we, we look for our own reflection in it. So we are a hierarchical society and we project that on the past. But in fact, it turned out this was not a hierarchical society. It never made war with anyone. It lived in, in peace and harmony with its neighbors. And uh, lo and behold, amongst the imports were hallucinogenic snuffs uh, from the Amazon. So the point I'm making is that ancient high civilizations had no problem uh, with uh, visionary plants. Uh, Francisco de Orellana was uh, one of the conquistadors. Um, and he set off one morning with about 20 of his men uh, on a, what they thought was going to be a one-day hunting expedition on the Amazon. However, the Amazon disagreed. Um, its current was too strong and they were unable to go back. So they had to go forward and they ended up in the Atlantic Ocean, as a matter of fact, after a journey of more than 4,000 miles through the Amazon jungle. And uh, Orellana uh, passed back incredible reports when he'd completed the journey, which he survived, and, and wrote about it. Um, he spoke of the, the intelligent and skill of the peoples of the Amazon um, and, and the, their incredible works of art, and he spoke of huge cities in the Amazon, huge cities in the Amazon jungle. Uh, subsequent generations disbelieved him. They said that Orellana had made this all up in order to... Uh, aggrandize himself, that he had been the discoverer of great cities in the mysterious Amazon jungle. Uh, it was completely dismissed and thought to be a, a, a fantasy or a, or a lie by Orellana until the tragic uh, clearances of the Amazon jungle, which are now, now taking place. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, huge cities, the remains of huge cities, are emerging in the heart of the Amazon jungle. Um, they're not populated anymore. Why? Uh, because the smallpox that the Spanish brought into the Americas uh, by the end of the 15th century, uh, the 16th century, had completely wiped out their populations. Um, we find in the Amazon this extraordinary self-replicating man-made soil called Terra Preta, the Black Earth, uh, which is enormously fertile and productive and is found dotted around uh, all over the Amazon. It's becoming clear that the Amazon is not a pristine and never was a pristine rainforest. It's a managed habitat, managed by human beings who absolutely knew what they were doing. Um, we see earthworks emerging from the clearances, huge geoglyphs, uh, even stone circles and megalithic monuments. So there's a, a secret story of the Amazon, I believe, awaiting, awaiting to be told. Uh, it's the home to more than 150,000 different species of plants and trees. Um, and uh, this is one of those 150,000 different species of plants and trees. This one is called Chacruna uh, in the Amazon. Um, and the botanical name is Cicotria viridis, and the leaves uh, contain DMT, di dimethyltryptamine. Um, I'm sure most people in this audience are aware of the the chemistry, the chemistry of DMT in a sense that um, normally you cannot uh, achieve an altered state of consciousness by taking DMT orally uh, because of the uh, enzyme monoamine oxidase in the gut which switches off DMT on contact. That's why people smoke DMT. Um, but uh, in the Amazon, the DMT in these leaves is used in a, in a powerful visionary brew um, and uh, it is rendered orally active by cooking it with this, which is the ayahuasca vine, the vine of, the, vine of souls, uh, which uh, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Now, that's really quite an extraordinary uh, feat of ethnopharmacology to select two plants out of the 150,000 in the Amazon, which will only work when put together. To arrive at that is... Uh, Quite a, quite a work of science, as a matter of fact. And so that's the combination of the, the leaves and the vine cooked together. Broken the, they break up the vine, cook it, put it in the cooking pot, 300 or so leaves on top of it, then cook um, and uh, reduce it down to a sort of sticky consistency in the bottom of the pot. 
pour it off, usually into plastic bottles these days, add more water, do it again, and you know, eventually you end up with a liter or two of this, this uh, brew, which is sometimes red in color and, and sometimes more or less black. And that is the ayahuasca brew. Uh, who's drunk ayahuasca in the audience, may I ask? Okay, quite a few of us. Um, th this, is, this in itself is an intriguing ph phenomenon that out of the threatened Amazon jungle, uh, the intelligence of the jungle has emerged and uh, in the form of a vine is, is spreading around the world and profoundly affecting uh, human consciousness, I would say. Um, of course, it's an absolutely grotesque and disgusting taste as uh, those who've drunk ayahuasca will know. I have met a few people who actually like the taste of ayahuasca, um, but I am not one of them. <laughs> uh, so what I normally compare it to is a, a heap of moldy old socks, um, uh, some uh, battery acid, sulfur, a bit of raw sewage, and somewhere in there a hint of chocolate. <laughs> um, and so you drink your... You drink your little cup of ayahuasca and, and um, the moment it passes your lips you know that something serious is uh, in discussion with you. Um, and and uh, after about, typically about half an hour, 45 minutes coming up to the hour, you're going to start to feel quite nauseous. You may begin to sweat, you may feel a bit dizzy. This is the, the kind of onset of the, the ayahuasca experience which they call, by the way, the purge in the Amazon because there's a lot of vomiting and shitting involved with, with ayahuasca. And Westerners mm, find that difficult. You know, the first time I drank ayahuasca in the Amazon the, with a group of other people, the pr prospect of having to sort of rush behind a tree in full hearing of everybody else was quite, quite alarming to me. But I quickly got over my inhibitions. Um, this, is, this is one of the things that ayahuasca teaches you, that, you, you know, your body is actually the least important part of you. It's your vehicle, it's there, but it's your ve vehicle for your consciousness. And what's happening at the level of consciousness with ayahuasca is utterly, uh, utterly extraordinary. Um, there's other, another way of essentially the same brew, and that's um, yahe, uh, which, which is not made, the, the, the DMT does not come from Sikoche viridis, it comes from Diplopteris cabrirana, um, and in includes some 5-MAO uh, DMT as well. I actually prefer yahe to the original uh, ayahuasca. Um, this is in the Andes still. Uh, we're on uh, a, a journey to a place called Chavin de Huantar. Uh, you drive up about 200 kilometers north of Lima and then you turn right into the Andes and up here you're at about uh, 14 and a half thousand feet above sea level and then you drop down uh, into the valley where Chavin is situated um, and this, um, uh, this sign is, is there. Uh, near this town of Chavin lies a great edifice made of well-carved stones of notable grandeur. Uh, it was a huaca and the sharing and, and the shrine of the most famous of the pagans as Rome or Jerusalem is to make their offerings and sacrifices because the devil in this place gave them many oracles. And thus they came from all over the kingdom. And they talk about huge halls beneath the ground and rooms and... Um, certain stories that these extend under the river and so on. And this is from 1616. The Spanish uh, massively suppressed uh, the use of visionary plants uh, in the Americas. That was one of their major projects, as a matter of fact, was to, to sever that uh, connection with the visionary realm. Um, but when you go to Chavin, the whole place is... Um, a shrine to visionary experience. It's a huge sanctuary of visionary experience. These underground halls where you can you know, meet imagery like this creature um, were, were places of uh, vision incubation uh, where, where visionary exp experiences were explored and examined. And we know what the visionary agent was. Uh, it was the San Pedro cactus uh, where the active ingredient is uh, mescaline. And uh, we can see iconography from Chavin, which shows the, the, the San Pedro cactus and the prominent role it played in that high culture of the Americas. And then, um, if we go to Mexico, 
Again, the point I'm making is that ancient cultures did not despise and hate and fear these substances. They gave them an honored place in their society. And they understood what they were dealing with. They weren't, they weren't driven by fear and stupidity. Um, and so we have a deer with a peyote button. It influences the art of the, 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 the region, a peyote bowl from Western Mexico. And this is the peyote cactus. And again, the active ingredient, as with San Pedro, uh, is uh, mescaline. And again, you know, we're looking at a, at a culture that recorded tremendous achievements in architecture and, 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 and the arts. Uh, and their embracing of visionary experience uh, seems to have enhanced rather than limited that. Um, Psilocybe Mexicana is, uh, is honored all over the ancient Maya regions. These are Maya mushroom stones, Guatemala, Guatemala before 1500 BC. Um, this is uh, from La Venta on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you see the earliest representation of the uh, feathered serpent of the Quetzalcoatl figure here. And, and also you see these, these huge carved stone heads weighing 30, 40 tons in some cases, uh, which have very distinctive and unusual features. It belonged to a culture that archaeologists called the Olmec, which just means the rubber people, because this was the area where rubber was grown, and their predecessor culture to the, to the Maya. Um, what do we know about the Olmec? Well, we know they cultivated visionary experience. Um, this is uh, some of their art, which is, which is drawing on the, the theme of the Amanita muscaria uh, mushroom. And uh, so we see an Olmec baby. They, they were really into weird jaguars, the Olmecs. Uh, an Olmec baby weir jaguar wearing an Amanita muscaria mushroom cap and uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom transforming into the, the jaguar god. And then, of course, there's the, the mysterious substance called Soma in the Vedas. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's really worth investigating this and, and exploring it. Um, when, you, when you read the Vedic text, it sounds like a visionary substance in the, in the oldest texts. Um, that has been resisted by scholars who don't want our ancestors to have cultivated visionary experiences. But um, an enormous body of work has been done on this, and it's very clear now that uh, soma uh, was a visionary substance originally, uh, and that it was uh, a, a, a drink made from the Amanita muscaria mushroom in some way. So the question is, what was that, what was that drink? Um, Look, with Amanita muscaria, in order to achieve the most powerful visionary effects, uh, you need to drink it in urine. What can I say? I mean, the human body, in fact an animal's body too, acts as a filter which removes impurities from Amanita muscaria and leaves you with the pure psychedelic substance. So, shamans in um, the, the, the Tungus Mongol area who work with uh, Amanita muscaria um, will uh, eat the, the mushroom and then they'll pee into a bowl and then others in their community will drink from the, the bowl. And actually it's been found that you can pass uh, Amanita muscaria through seven human bodies before it loses its potency. Um, so it's intriguing and really quite definitive that the Vedic texts when they speak of Soma talk of the priests drinking Soma and, bluntly, pissing Soma. You drink tea, you piss, you know, piss, but uh, if it's a brew based on Amanita muscaria, then the active ingredient is passed on in urine, and that seems to be what's implied in the, in the Vedic text. Of course, there's much more to it than that. Uh, ancient Greece, uh, the light of ancient Greece was Eleusis. Uh, and it's a sad ruin today outside of Athens, but uh, it, was, uh, it was the light of the ancient world. It was renowned, it was famous. People came from all over the world. Its, its initiates uh, included Plato, Aristotle, Sophocles, Cicero. Cicero said actually that Athens has given nothing to the world more excellent or divine than the Eleusinian mysteries. And initiates who went into the telestrial on this darkened room after drinking a brew called the Kaikion uh, had experiences, reported experiences, that had transformed their lives. They, their lives were transformed. They lost their fear of death. 
uh, for example, happy is he who having seen these rites goes below the hollow earth, for he knows the end of life, and he knows it's God's sent beginning, that's, that's Pindar. And Sophocles, thrice happy are those mortals who having seen these rites depart for Hades, for them alone is granted to have a true life there. Now, again, the scholarship is, is excellent on this. The road to Eunusus is a, is a f very detailed study of this, and there's really no doubt that the Kaikion uh, consisted of barley with claviceps, uh, claviceps paspali, which is a non-poisonous form of ergot containing LSD-like visionary alkaloids. So those life-transforming experiences in the Telestrion at Eleusis uh, were mediated by something like an LSD trip. Um, really, we shouldn't be surprised to find the use of psychedelics at the heart of so many advanced ancient civilizations. They, they've, I believe, played a key role in the emergence of modern human behavior, a role which our society is now vigorously attempting to deny. Uh, well, this is what I call six million years of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, <coughs> the, um, the uh, uh, long story of uh, our evolution from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, roughly six million years ago. And uh, it really is, for a very long period, an incredibly dull and unchanging story. Our first stone tools are supposedly invented about two and a half million years ago, and that's what they look like. The older one, stone tool traditions. Our ancestors had made a breakthrough. They had started to shape rocks and to use them. But they were so pleased with that breakthrough that having made it, they then stuck with it without any change for the next million years. <laughs> A million years. So what does this tell us? It tells us, okay, cultural information is being passed down and also that our ancestors are locked in a very narrow, rigid frame and are not seeing to the sides, so they just stick with what they know and they keep passing it down, passing it down. Then they do make a change, the Acheulean tool tradition. But once they've introduced these, they stick with them for a million years as well. <laughs> uh, would have been a boring dinner conversation, I believe. <laughs> and then, really quite suddenly and dramatically, we get this transcendence happening. We get the, the incredible cave art. Now, it's important to be clear, that this is late. This is after 40,000 years ago. The first inklings of it are a bit earlier than that. You might go back to 100,000 years. But uh, our ancestors had been anatomically modern for a long time before this, uh, at least as far back as 200,000 years. Some might argue more. You have anatomically modern uh, human, human beings. We have a skeleton from Ethiopia that's 196,000 years old and is really indistinguishable from a modern uh, skeletal form. So, it looks as though the, the human hardware was in place a long time ago, but the behavior of those anatomically modern ancestors remained archaic and frankly extremely dull for a long, long time until this kind of stuff starts happening, and it starts happening quite suddenly, and it happens uh, all, apparently all over the world. I mean, the view is that the oldest cave art in Europe is about 40,000 years old. Just recently in Indonesia, cave art of the same age has been found. And, uh, and astonishingly, it's very similar themes to the cave art of Europe. Um, there are certain distinctive characteristics of this art, and the most distinctive of all is that it includes what are called therianthropes, creatures that are part animal and part human uh, in form, from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means Man. So here's a very ancient piece from Italy, the oldest piece from Italy, Fumani Cave. <coughs> we have a, a human body, but the head and horns of, of some kind of bull-like creature, probably an, an aurochs, the ancestor of modern cattle. And over here from um, Hollenstein Stadel Cave in Germany, this is uh, carved in three dimensions out of mammoth ivory, and it's a, it's a lion man. It's a creature that's part lion, part human. Um, is it... Often it's suggested that these are you know, people dressed up in animal skins acting out the part of a particular animal, but I think that's extremely simplistic. Uh, there's more going on than that. Uh, we can see it clearly um, when we, we go to Chauvet Cave and look at this, uh, this image here, where Bison Man, it's about 32,000 years old, Bison Man here is straddling a, a, a female form, but oddly she's he headless, 
And then if we look over here, we see that her right arm is actually transforming into the head of a, a lion. Um, and that's not something that you see every day, you know. It's a moment of... <laughs> <clears throat> it's a moment of transformation that's taking place there. We have to ask ourselves, what was the inspiration for this kind of imagery? Or here in South Africa, in the Drakensberg, um, human figures, but they have the heads of elands. This fellow's growing wings, it seems, a couple of feathers sprouting out of his back. And this lumpy stuff around this one, that's actually a couple of snakes. W both of them have got the heads of elands as well. Um, so it's really complicated shape-shifting, transforming, transforming kind of image. And, and again, did this come purely from the imagination of the artist, or is there, something, is there something else going on? Like up here in the Cedarberg, perched on a zigzag, these, these humans in the process of transforming into antelopes. And then, of course, we get all these curious geometric patterns in the cave art, this, this grid between two ibexes from Lascaux. Uh, and, and here from El Castillo Cave in Spain, sort of flows of dots running down the cave walls and these geometric patterns. What's it all about? For about a century, actually, the study of cave art was um, very limited. The initial notion was that um, it was a kind of sympathetic magic, that the, the, it was hunting magic, that the, the, the artists would depict the animals that they wanted to hunt, and then they would depict them as pierced, and that in some way they would then magically acquire the animal. It's complete rubbish. But it dominated uh, cave art studies for a very, very long time, followed by another rubbish theory called structuralism. Um, it really wasn't until quite recently that we had uh, scholars who got to grips with this problem. I'll preface this by, by, by saying all tribute to Terence McKenna and the uh, amazing work that Terence did over the, uh, over the years and his wonderful book, uh, Food of the Gods, uh, which, which raises the, the possibility that, that psychedelic experiences were what ushered us into our full humanity. Uh, but it's important also to recognize that a number of, of mainstream scholars have been pursuing that actually from long before uh, Terence. David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa is the guy who made the real breakthrough in this field and his work goes back to the 1970s, and it draws in part on, on interesting results from the use of hallucinogens, LSD, DMT, etc., uh, to induce altered states of consciousness in human volunteers. Um, and and um, certain patterns uh, became uh, obvious universal phenomena of visionary experiences, the sense of passing through a vortex into a seamlessly convincing parallel universe, and then encounters, this is a volunteer in the 60s, um, he draws a man in a modern business suit, but with the head of a fox. Encounters with therianthropic entities, which are really no different from the therianthropic entities that we see on the cave walls and, and, and carved in mammoth ivory from tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and and uh, David's theory, which has now f fortunately become the ruling paradigm, and we can get some really serious work done on cave art, um, is uh, that it is an art of visions. That essentially, I don't want to misuse the word shaman, which is culturally specific and which belongs to the Tungus Mongol. It's been adopted and spread out, applied to many other cultures with similarly, similar ritual functionaries. But D David is essentially arguing that we're looking at the work of prehistoric shamans uh, who had um, put themselves into deeply altered states of consciousness, whether using visionary plants or fungi or whether using other techniques to get into altered states of consciousness. And that that's why the art all around the world has so much in common, certain distinctive characteristics, these patterns wrongly referred to as entoptic uh, f phenomena uh, and, and these uh, therianthropic uh, creatures. And this is, uh, th th this is what I would recommend of, of David's work inside the Neolithic mind. The mind in the cave is particularly good. Shamans of prehistory with uh, Jean Clot and so on. Um, so the point is that the characteristics of the art itself bear witness to the fact that the artists were experiencing deeply altered states of consciousness. And after returning to the everyday state of consciousness, were painting on the cave walls what they'd seen in their visionary states. Um, and that evidence goes, goes back at least 40,000 years. 
Um, however, quite recently, New Scientist 2011 trumpeted this as the earliest evidence of magic mushroom use in Europe. It's like if we didn't get it from the patterns and the imagery, let for God's sake get it from Psilocybe Hispanica painted on the walls of this cave. Um, and uh, st what's intriguing is that in the, the long story of human evolution, the, the great leap forward, the biggest change in the evolution of human behavior accompanies that moment when through our ancestors' art, they demonstrate to us that they were embracing, experiencing, and exploring altered states of consciousness. And, and alongside that, that art, we get stone tools, hunting tactics, spiritual ideas, all take a huge leap forward. Burial of the dead with grave goods uh, implies that you believe some aspect of the deceased in individual survives death, will need food and water uh, beyond death. <laughs> Um, and there, there's some linguistic evidence that suggests that this was the time when spoken languages first appeared. It's the, undoubtedly the most significant change in the whole story of the evolution of human behavior. And we could say that it correlates with evidence that our ancestors were using psychedelics. I'm inclined to say that the relationship is causative, but I can't, I can't prove that. There's a strong correlation. Um, in the light of the evidence from the painted caves, we need to take a look at, fresh look at ancient art from all around the world and w w with, a, with a, a view to looking whether psychedelics might have been involved. For, for example, there's this tortita ceramic from Ecuador. Well, we have a right arm transforming into a serpent, a left arm transforming into a serpent here, just like this figure from Chauvet transforming into a lion. Um, and this bird-headed figure of the Maya, 600 AD, Olmec stone figurine with feline features and so on and so forth. And of course, other famous works of art, uh, the, the Minotaur. Everybody's familiar with the story of the Minotaur. Well, what is the Minotaur if not a classic therianthrope, which is part animal and part human in form, a creature of vision, a uh, bull man wrestling with a lion from Akkad. Um, these imagery from ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and of course, all of the ancient Egyptian uh, deities were classic entities of vision. Therianthropes, um, human headed serpents, the god Thoth, the head of a bird, god Anubis, a jackal. Here we see a woman gazing at her own soul, which is depicted as a, a human headed bird. So it's reasonable to wonder why, why, you know, I mean, really, we have great pride in ourselves as a society. You know, we think we're the bee's knees, we're the, uh, the absolute ultimate pinnacle of the human story. But if you look at it rationally, we're, we're like this little pimple, you know, this little pimple on the, 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 the giant story of our past. They're, they're right on the top of the whole story of the human past. There's this tiny, ugly little pimple, which is modern society, which claims to know everything and which has divorced itself from the spiritual roots of our species. Um, so, yeah, why, why, are, why is our society so rabid about psychedelics? What is it that those in power are really afraid of? That they're prepared to go to such extremes to, to demonize and persec persecute those of us who choose to use these extraordinary visionary agents? Um, of course, it's a serious criminal offense to possess DMT in, in our society, whether in the ayahuasca brew or, or in, in smokable form. I mean, our possession of these kinds of substances can result in the doors of our home being broken down, large armed or thuggish men entering, entering our house, entering our privacy, and, and um, ruining our lives and, and sending us to jail. So, so the, the, clearly this is something that our society is, is determined to to stop and, and, and to persecute and, and, and to demonize. Well, why should it be the case that a sovereign adult who makes a choice to explore the mystery of his or her consciousness using visionary agents while doing no harm to others, why should that person serve a jail term for that? Well, what's, what's, where's, where's the logic of this? We're supposed to be free. The, the, this is a, a society that, that claims it's the freest society that's ever existed in the world. And what complete rubbish. It's a society that actively seeks to control and limit the conscious experiences of its, of its members. 
And that is, in my view, a, a gigantic invasion of a fundamental human right, which is our right to make choices about our own bodies and our own consciousness, so long as we do no harm to others. And we have plenty of rules already in society that deal with the harm we may do to others. I don't think we need more rules that seek to patrol our consciousness uh, in this way. And anyway, it's hypocritical. Because this is a society that mm, is quite happy about lots of altered states of consciousness and, and, and the licenses big pharmaceutical companies to make billions of dollars every year producing consciousness-altering agents. So there's this kind of unholy alliance between big pharma and psychiatry that results in new mental illnesses being invented every year so that new pills can be prescribed for them. And we have things you know, like the antidepressants, Prozac, Siroxat, Ritalin is a consciousness-altering drug as well. Clearly, the objection is not to the altering of consciousness as such. Uh, our society is into that already in a, in a big way. We glorify the most boring drug on the planet, um, which is, by the way, probably the most dangerous drug on the planet, which is if the argument is that our society is seeking to protect us from the dangers of drugs, then why is this stuff out there? in such profusion, and why is it advertised and, and glorified in this way? Because it's responsible for tens of thousands of deaths a year. Uh, more, more and more, we're, we're finding cirrhosis of the liver in, in relatively young uh, individuals. Um, consider the car accidents, consider the fights, consider all the problems with alcohol, and ask yourself, is our society really honest in its view about altered states of consciousness, since it embraces this kind of altered state of consciousness? Uh, you know, I mean, if you... Let, uh, we all enjoy a drink. I'm going through a, a temporary uh, break from alcohol, which is now five months long. I'm feeling quite good about that. I feel much, much better since I stopped drinking that, that poison as well. But um, what, uh, what, what are we doing when we take a drink, a glass of beer or a, a glass of wine? We may like the taste, but... Truly and honestly, we're drinking that substance because of its effect on consciousness. It takes the edge off at the end of a long, busy day. and We make all sorts of reasons why, but fundamentally, we're enjoying it because it's a consciousness-altering agent. So our society is not against consciousness-altering agents as such. Um, and, and, and actually, we're a creature for, for whom many different states of consciousness are available. And the problem, I think, is that our society focuses only on one state of consciousness, which I refer to as the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. Um, it particularly values and glorifies this state of consciousness. Um, and I think this is, this is dangerous. I think this is a problem. Um, that, that we have an... I'm not against the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness as such. As a matter of fact, I'm very much for it. It's a really good thing. When, when I get on an aeroplane, I want to be sure that the pilot is in an alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. <laughs> I would like him to stay that way until the end of the flight, after which his head is his own business and none of mine. Um, but the problem is, if we make it the only state of consciousness that we really value, does that result in a society that's twisted or skewed in certain ways? And I, I would say that it does. And I think that the, the toleration of alcohol and antidepressants is because they don't challenge the dominant order. And I think psychedelics are not tolerated because they do challenge the dominant order. They do lead people, in very many cases, to start asking questions and thinking for themselves, just as the earliest Christians appear to have done. Uh, within early Christianity, there were several groups, and one of them called themselves Gnostics. Um, and... Uh, Later on, they were overwhelmed by what became the Catholic Church, the literalist faction. But, but in the early days, there was an interesting phenomena going on with the Gnostics, and they certainly valued uh, the Silasites. Um, we know about the Gnostics, fortunately, because a group of Gnostics at a place called Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt uh, buried a library of their texts in the 400s, round about the time that they, they were suffering the worst persecutions. Um, they buried them. Perhaps they intended to return to them, but they never did. And that Nag Hammadi library, as it's called, stayed buried until 1945. It was near, uh, very near, the Temple of Hathor at uh, Dendera in Upper Egypt. 
And uh, as a result of that discovery, we now can allow the Gnostics to speak for themselves. Previously, our knowledge of Gnosticism was based on the statements of those who had persecuted the Gnostics, so highly unreliable. Uh, now that we have the Gnostic text, we can get a sense of what Gnosticism was all about, and it certainly was a, was a system that sought to um, separate itself as much as possible from the material realm, but it's wrong to say that Gnosticism hated the material realm. If we look at the Sophia mythos within, within Gnosticism, the earth itself is a, is a fallen aeon, is a, is, is, is a living entity, a goddess, and, and it's difficult to imagine that the Gnostics hated matter as much as they've been uh, accused of doing. At any rate, the Gnostics had a radical idea about God, who they associated with the, the Plerima, beyond all these other areas. I won't go into Gnostic cosmology um, at, at the moment, it's too, it's too complicated, but the, 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 the take-home message is that the entity who we have been taught to believe is God, the entity called Jehovah or Allah or Yahweh or God, was for the Gnostics the demiurge, uh, a kind of demon, actually. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the movie The Usual Suspects said the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that he did not exist. The Gnostics would change that slightly and say the greatest trick the devil ever played would be to convince the world that he is God. Um, and uh, he's the chief of the archons, who are sort of the evil angels that mingle with humanity and lead us onto paths that are hostile to the nature of the soul. And he's a malicious, egotistical, minor, supernatural... Um, he's jealous, he's angry, he, you know, he tells Abraham to murder his own son. He's a he, 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 ghastly creature, actually. If you look at the statements and behavior of this entity in the Old Testament, then, and we're told that we're, we are the creature who's going to dominate the world. There's all sorts of really horrible ideas in that miasma of texts, and sitting at the top of it is this thing which, from the Gnostic point of view, wasn't God at all. I realize that this is very disturbing, uh, to those who are, who are committed to the Christian message. I don't mean to do that, but this is, this is what the Gnostics thought. Um, so, it's interesting. If you look at the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, in the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, now, of course, in the mainstream, who's the bad guy in the Garden of Eden story? The serpent. Okay? He goes to Adam and Eve, he goes to Eve, and he says, you have to have knowledge of good and evil, You've got to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that's portrayed as a terrible thing that he did. It's the fall of man, supposedly the fall of man. From the Gnostic point of view, the serpent is the hero of the story. The serpent is the good guy, uh, because from the Gnostic point of view, knowledge of good and evil is essential for the progress of the soul. Uh, if we live in a, a farmed, protected universe where we're just these kind of meat robots without any consciousness and we don't know any difference between good and evil and we can't make any choices, how can we possibly grow? How can we possibly develop? We live in a university of duality. I'm not saying that's a phrase used by a friend of mine. I'm not saying that duality is all there is, but the suggestion is that on this plane of existence, duality has lessons to teach us and that's what good and evil uh, are, are about. So it's fascinating when we look at the Gnostic image of the tree of life that it's a psychedelic mushroom. Uh, not a tree, but a visionary agent. Um, and uh, when we look at the whole Garden of Eden story, uh, we can see that the serpent is a therianthrope, almost always depicted as a, as a human-headed serpent. So, for eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden in humiliating ways, beaten about the bottom with the edge of swords. Um, angels are posted at the edges of the garden to keep them out, um, lest they find their way to the tree of life. Uh, and uh, we've been taught, we've taken it in with our mother's milk, since childhood, that this is, this is right, this is the right thing. But, but actually, what, what, what is going on here? Here, is the learning of the knowledge of good and evil leads to the expulsion from, from the garden? What kind of God is that? Same goes with the flood. Um, according to the Gnostics, it was not inflicted to punish evil, but to punish humanity for having risen so high and to take the light, the gnosis that were, was growing amongst men, and the survivors were thrown into great distraction and into a life of toil 
so that mankind might be occupied with worldly affairs and might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the human spirit. The, the, the Gnostic notion is that there is a divine spark within all of us and that the Demiurge and the Archons, their project is to snuff that divine spark out. Uh, and we can only awaken it through revealed knowledge, through, through Gnosis. And the suggestion is that that revealed knowledge for the Gnostics was connected with psychedelic experience. Uh, throughout history, those who've sought the liberating Gnosis uh, have been persecuted. And uh, although the stamping out of early Gnosticism in the Middle East goes back to about the 400s uh, AD, 4 500s, uh, there was a more recent form of Gnosticism which found its way into southern France. Uh, and these are the famous Cathars who lived in the area that we call the Languedoc or Occitania uh, today. Um, they were in, in many ways an extraordinarily uh, beautiful civilization. Um, if you go back to the 12th century, um, they were in favor of uh, universal literacy. They, they, were, they invented and, and distributed paper. Um, they, they believed in the absolute equality of men and women. It was the Cathar society that produced the troubadours of their amazing art. There, there were, there were, it was a flourishing civilization that would have moved, I think, in interesting directions of human freedom if it had been allowed to evolve, but they had one problem, which is that they regarded the Pope as the agent of the devil on earth. Um, and that was a very dangerous thing to do in the 12th century. And as a result, um, uh, a crusade was declared against them. It was called the Albigensian Crusades, named after the town of Albi, one of the Cathar towns. And uh, really terrible things ha happened. This, this army came down from northern France, you know, seething with harm and anger and they entered into the Cathar lands and they just murdered everybody. There was one famous occasion when one of the generals came to the leader of the crusade and, and pointed out that some Catholics were living in the city of Béziers. What was to be done about them? And, and the, the, the pontiffs, the, 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 the leader simply said, kill them all, God will choose his own, God will know his own. Horrible, horrible incident of genocide and ethnic cleansing uh, in the relatively recent past. And of course, the burnings at the stake. Consider what it takes the mental state you've got to be in to burn a fellow human being at the stake. I mean, I can't think of a more ghastly way to die. And some who've been burnt at the stake, which is actually a form of human sacrifice, let's face it. I mean, that's what's happening when people are burnt at the stake by the Catholic Church in the past. It's a human sacrifice which is being offered to their God, their perhaps demonic God. Um, it's a terrible way to die. The, the fat in your body begins to bubble and burn. It's a ghastly, ghastly death. So if you're going to inflict that on the human being, another human being, what is going on in your mind that you would actually do that? And it was done cheerfully and in, in, in huge numbers. The Cathars were burnt at the stake. Their books that were destroyed, utter destruction. Um, and, and from the Gnostic point of view, the Demiurge and his archons and their human servants, they're always trying to steal the light. And you know, they're certainly doing so today. And if there's light growing, and I think it is, then we can be sure that tremendous archonic forces are working to suppress it. And, you know, if we take the hypothesis that the Gnostic scenario is correct just for the sake of argument, then how might we expect these forces to manifest? Um, well, like this. The priests, the rabbis, the mullahs of the three Abrahamic faiths, uh, those three faiths that have been responsible for so much horror, in the world over the last 2,000 years are still at it. They're still the jealous intermediaries who impose themselves between us and the divine, who do not want us to have direct contact with the realm of spirit, and, and who I would say have been systematically misguiding uh, humanity and are at the source of, of the terrible problems that we confront in, in, in the world today. The Gnostics would say, don't look at what they say, look at what they do. Because they all talk the talk of peace and love and harmony, but the walk they walk is often very different. Women are still being stoned to death in Islamic societies uh, today. For what? Being unfaithful to their husbands? What? And, and in the name of God? This is obviously insane. It's completely insane. It's only 17, early 1700s was the last burning at the stake. And we know the ongoing problems of the Catholic Church. Um, 
the mass murder recently of the minority Yazidis uh, in, uh, in Iraq uh, by Islamic State. The, the Yazid religion has its roots in ancient Gnosticism. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we all saw this story. I, I would say, I, I hate the fact that it calls itself Isis, after a the wonderful ancient Egyptian goddess, but, but, but um, I, I would say it's just another Abrahamic death cult. There's plenty of them. They've been littering the human story for a very long time. It's just the latest example of another Abrahamic death cult. And then another, of course, another iconic force is the state itself, uh, which, which takes our money and our power and challenges it into turns it into bureaucracies, which then control us and claim that they are acting in our interests and running our running our lives. That's, that's basically depriving us of the right to responsibility, to making responsible choices as adults. That's what the state constantly uh, militates against. And the state system around the world is, is based on the manipulation of fear and hatred and suspicion uh, to divide us from one another, to say that we, members of this country, are special and different from members of that country. I absolutely detest patriotism. It is an awful thing. I, I, let's get rid of this terrible, <laughs> regressive state. You know? Why should I feel specially loyal to somebody else just because they happened to be born on the same piece of land I was? Why? I don't get it. It's their ideas I'm interested in. Can I form a community of ideas with this person or not? I don't care. I don't care what country they come from or what religion they were reared in or the color of their skin or any of that. <coughs> Bullshit, and, that, and it's that bullshit that, that is being manipulated and managed to create this climate of fear and hatred and suspicion that's so horrible in the world today. And that's all about nations competing against nations, and it's time we moved on from that. I'm not talking about one world government. Don't get me wrong. I want no government whatsoever. Just... I believe it. Human beings left to, their own, left to their own devices can act wisely and with love. I don't think we need the state, the state to teach us to do that. I think that's one of the myths that's been passed down uh, through history. Uh, and then, of course, we have the big corporations. And uh, that pernicious influence, the um, news media, which churn out 24 hours a day a continuous diet of horror and misery and fear and hatred and suspicion. All of this radically affecting our consciousness. Um, a kind of consciousness monopoly is being imposed. Uh, and, and I think by, by giving an effective monopoly to a single state of consciousness, enforcing that monopoly with draconian criminal sanctions, I think it's a dangerous thing to do may even be a suicidal thing to do for our society. Oh, say, yeah, I mean, that alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, it's, it's good for all kinds of things like this, you know, um, good for a bit of politics and uh, commerce, so on and so forth. And, and there was a kind of endless promise in our society that we just, you know, did things that way, focused on the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, that we would somehow achieve some kind of, I don't know, um, material nirvana, uh, but you know, we've all been through the last decade and clearly it's not true. Our, our big financial institutions cannot go on magically printing money forever and throwing it at the banks. The, the, the system is broken, it's just that the breaks in it are being cunningly concealed at the moment. And then of course it's a system that uh, tolerates and generates enormous amounts of horrendous pollution around the world. <laughs> and it's a system that has nuclear bombs. I mean, how, can you get crazier than that? To have whole societies that are investing in making nuclear weapons? I caught a little bit of the news today. Seems um, Jeremy Corbyn has got himself in trouble because he said that he would not press that fucking button. He would not press it. Well, good for him. I don't, I don't know much about Jeremy Corbyn, but good for him for saying that. And, and, you know, the, 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 the Tory media have come back with saying that he is actually threatening Britain's security by saying that. In other words, that, so actually not firing a nuclear bomb is a threat to security? Well, I mean, what on earth is going on? Isn't it obvious that we live in a completely insane, unconscious society? 
completely insane. Otherwise, we'd all be just aghast at this. This kind of, we wouldn't tolerate a single nuclear weapon. No sane society ever would. We can't solve the problem of hunger on a global scale. Ah, and we stand by um, and do nothing while the sacred realm of the Amazon, this, this unique preserve of biodiversity, is uh, destroyed by the forces of short term profit. Um, we can lay, raise countless trillions of dollars for warfare, but we are unable to put together the funding as a global community to make it attractive for the peoples of the Amazon Basin not to allow the rainforest to be destroyed anymore. It would be pennies, actually, to sort that out by comparison with what we do on military expenditure, but we are so crazy that this is what we're investing the largest sums in. Um, so, I think a new state of consciousness is badly needed, actually, but uh, we're not going to move to it um, using the old state of consciousness. Gnosticism won't help us, it's been shattered by 2,000 years of persecution, um, and yet in unexpected places, we can learn from a system of direct spiritual knowledge that taps into those same wellsprings. And that would be, for example, the Amazon jungle. Uh, where there are uncontacted tribes who <laughs> really surprised to learn that, uh, you know, there's things flying over in flying machines from some weird society. That's us, you know. <laughs> they don't even know that we exist. Um, in my time in the Amazon, I, I discussed global problems to some extent with, with uh, shamans, um, and, and they said something to me that stuck in my mind. Um, which is that the sickness of the advanced urban societies is we've severed our connection with spirit. It's as simple as that. And, and the remedy that they propose is, of course, ayahuasca. Um, and uh, if you haven't drunk ayahuasca, these paintings from Pablo Amaringo uh, give some sense of the enchanted realm that we enter into in the ayahuasca visionary state. Um, this, these are paintings by uh, Alex Gray, who I'm proud to call a friend, great visionary artist, and, and the late Robert Venosa. Um, their work and the work of many other artists today is inspired by visionary experiences with ayahuasca. And it's about the sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. Uh, a life review is a very common part of the ayahuasca experience. It's one of the reasons why people often burst into tears during ayahuasca sessions. Uh, because you get to see the story of your own life from the point of view of others who you have impacted. Uh, and you may have impacted them negatively, and you may have denied that to yourself. But in ayahuasca, you'll see it absolutely clear how you really behaved. And uh, again and again, you find that you don't measure up to the mark. Um, this is not self-indulgent. What, what happens with ayahuasca when you get these insights uh, is that it gives you the incentive to change your behavior. We cannot go back and put right past mistakes. There's nothing can be done about the past. But we don't have to carry on repeating them. Uh, and, and ayahuasca, I think, is very helpful. Um, certainly has been for me uh, in, in getting people to make conscious changes in the direction of their, of their lives. And it's why... Uh, ayahuasca is incredibly effective in getting people off addictions to hard drugs like uh, cocaine and uh, heroin. There's a number of places where this is done. The Takiwasi Clinic at Tarapoto in Peru has got a fantastic record of getting people off addictions to hard drugs. Gabo Mate in Canada was pursuing a very successful practice with, with drug addicts and ayahuasca, but the Canadian government stepped in and stopped him on the grounds that ayahuasca is a drug. So what, they want to give them methadone instead? You know. um, and the spirit of ayahuasca, this is why my TED talk was banned, because I was willing to contemplate the possibility that, that mother ayahuasca actually might be a real entity on another dimensional level, like a kind of goddess, a bit like meeting Athena or you know, Venus. Um, most frequently encountered as a creative guide, as a healer, and as a moral teacher, very often amongst Western drinkers of ayahuasca, she is construed as a, as a female. 
Um, that's not always the case in the Amazon. Some of the Amazon tribes see the spirit of ayahuasca as male. We're dealing with a shapeshifter. Um, it seems that her, her feminine uh, incarnation is particularly appropriate to the consciousness changes that are badly needed in the West at the moment. Um, so, you know, what actually are we doing here? What journey are we on? What is consciousness? What happens when we die? What is reality? Uh, consciousness is a mystery. Brain is certainly involved in it. And most materialist scientists will tell you it's obvious that the brain makes consciousness, roughly the way that a, a generator makes electricity. Uh, because if you damage an area of the brain, an area of consciousness is affected. And so it seems, shall I say, a no-brainer that the, that the brain makes consciousness. But that's an oversimplistic uh, conclusion from the evidence, because another possibility is that the relationship of consciousness to the brain is more like the relationship of a TV signal to a TV set. And sure enough, if you smash up your TV screen, the picture is going to be affected. But the signal will remain pure and unaffected. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know enough about consciousness yet to say that it is simply manufactured by the brain. There's, there's compelling evidence that it may be acting more as a transceiver or a receiver of consciousness. Uh, Albert Hoffman, the uh, discoverer of LSD. I'm sure most of us know the story. Experimenting in the Sandoz labs, uh, takes a bicycle ride home one day. Strange things begin to happen. He gets home, he's wondering if he's dying. Then he realizes that he's absorbed something through his skin, one of the synthetics of ergot that he was working with. And that was, that was LSD, he discovered it by accident. The next time he took what he thought would be a tiny dose, turned out to be a huge dose of LSD. <laughs> Um, and he went on working with LSD all the way through his life. For those who say that, you know, drugs shorten our lives, Albert Hoffman died at the age of 102, <laughs> fully in control of his uh, intelligence. So he made this point that, that reality is inconceivable without an experiencing subject, and this product of the exterior world, but also of a receiver. Um, and and um, maybe there's more to this exterior world than our senses even extended by fine scientific instruments are normally able to receive. Blake was on the same theme on the doors of perception. Um, if the doors of perception are, are cleansed, it would appear, uh, everything would appear to man as it is, uh, infinite. So the notion that, that the way we see reality is, is clouded and obscured and, and that we need to cleanse those doors of perception to get it straight. Uh, William James, the brother of the, the, the novelist uh, Henry James, <laughs> experimented with nitrous oxide back in 1901, not regarded as a major psychedelic today, but he had extraordinary experiences. Um, and uh, his impression, the truth of which has since remained unshaken, is that our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness. Uh, and, and that other kinds of consciousness lie all around it, we might not suspect their existence, but if we apply the requisite stimulus and touch, they're all there in their completeness. And the, the key point is that no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. Uh, at any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. And I would say that's the problem with science and consciousness, is that it has prematurely closed its accounts with reality, and it's not taking into account the entire picture. Huxley saw the brain as a reducing valve, which is primarily about keeping stuff out, otherwise we'd just be overwhelmed. Uh, and he saw the psychedelics as gratuitous graces, which nature has provided to allow us to bypass that reducing valve from time to time. Uh, back to Hoffman again, um, and uh, he's the, the homing in on this receiver model of the brain, that the receiver is tuned into another wavelength than that corresponding to normal everyday reality and many different realities can become conscious. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico uses the notion of channel normal, that that's what we're tuned into most of the time. We're tuned into channel normal to function in everyday life. But uh, that there are likely other channels broadcasting at us all the time which we're not picking up, and, and that's what he's suggesting DMT does. Um, no longer is the show we're watching everyday reality, channel normal, DMT provides regular, repeated, reliable access to other channels. And Rick uh, is absolutely willing to consider the possibility that these worlds 
are usually invisible to us in our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist only in our minds is that they are in reality outside us and freestanding. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. In other words, this is a very radical suggestion uh, that we live in a multi-dimensional universe and all of those dimensions are filled with intelligence and we are shut off from most of them most of the time. But by altering our state of consciousness profoundly, we may gain access to them and perhaps learn uh, from them. Um, I've given this analogy many times, but I think it's a, it's a simple one and a, and a useful one. So, okay, imagine Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and uh, he's sitting beside an MRI scanner. And then there's a volunteer who's just been given a massive intravenous infusion of DMT. And the volunteer is pushed into the MRI scanner. I can't think of anything worse to do so to somebody on a DMT trip, as a matter of fact. But pushed into the MRI scanner. And uh, immediately the, the, the scanner starts to light up and we see activity in different areas of the brain. Richard Dawkins, he sits there. Uh, oh, and the subject is, you know, somehow very difficult to do in the DMT state, but is reporting his visions, okay? Just imagine that for the sake of it. So Dawkins says, I'm not seeing those visions, um, uh, but I do see changes in his brain chemistry, in his brain electricity. So his visions are just those changes in his brain. They can be reduced to those changes in the brain. Nothing more to them than that. No reality. Complete trivia. Ignore them. That's the Dawkins point of view. Well, the analogy is a telescope and a distant star. We want to look at a distant star. We go pointed at the right region of the heavens, first of all, and then we start to focus our telescope. And as we do so, physical, measurable changes take place inside the barrel of the telescope in the relationship between the lenses. Eventually, the star comes into view we'd be completely wrong to try to reduce the star to the changes inside the barrel of the telescope. Those changes have just allowed us to see something that's real, that was there, but we couldn't see before. And that's the suggestion with DMT, that that's what DMT and other psychedelics are doing by retuning the receiver wavelength of the brain. Science is certainly beginning to dip its toes into the water of psychedelic research again. And I very much welcome this development because these are incredible therapeutic agents and their, their power and potential uh, for healing is enormous. But I would like to see uh, the next step uh, coming along, as well as uh, all this work on the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. I think that the real exciting work to do with psychedelics concerns exploring the mystery of consciousness. I think we are, we are provided by nature with an absolutely perfect tool for putting volunteers in immediately into deeply altered states of consciousness and, and conducting scientific work on what those altered states of consciousness might actually mean, even on the realms that they, they enter. I know a couple of guys in Utah who spent an entire year going out into the desert every night with a DMT pipe. And they both smoked, smoked a pipe each, and then they got so good at it, they met on the other side. <laughs> and they started to explore the realm and they met regular characters who they were able to document and landscapes that they could report. Science should be doing work like this. Really important, just as important as exploring outer space as exploring inner space, finding out what we, what we really are. Um, of course, um, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were completely honest that we would not have you know, the um, Apple computer were it not for LSD. Uh, and their um, choice of programmers was heavily influenced by whether those programmers had experienced LSD. Um, this may be apocryphal, uh, but I think there's something to it that Crick um, was on LSD when he recognized the, the double helix. Of course, the story of the double helix is much more complicated than that and involved a bit of plagiarism on the part of Crick and Watson and other researchers. But maybe, maybe what Crick is reported to have told a friend that he had perceived the double helix shape while on LSD. We certainly know that Crick did use LSD regularly. Uh, maybe there's something to that. Maybe that's the moment he got it. He just got it suddenly. It's an interesting thought anyway. Um, so, you know, whatever these things are, they're not brain candy. Uh, used in the right way, responsibly, with love, with care, with the right intent, they can be utterly, utterly transformatory. And we should embrace that transformatory power because we are a civilization that needs 
transformation right now. If we go back to the, the Garden of Eden and this notion of the knowledge of good and evil, um, and remember that the serpent is um, a classic entity of vision, uh, that from time to time these kinds of encounters with visionary experiences do appear to have brought us the forbidden fruit uh, of Gnosis. Um, and it's interesting if you go back to the Garden of Eden story, the passage in Genesis uh, uh, concerning the, the driving out of Adam and Eve from the garden. They've eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the demiurge, Jehovah, whatever, is wanting, them, is, is wanting to make sure they don't come back lest they discover the tree of life and become gods like us. It's a very strange passage. Um, I would say that in all of this, somewhere deeply buried, the mystery of the knowledge of good and evil and the mystery of immortal life lies concealed. At any rate, we're in the midst of uh, a struggle for the future direction of human consciousness, be in no doubt about it. This, this is a time, this is an incredible time that we live in today. Two, three hundred years from now, if our species survives the insanity of this time, we will look back on it as, as a time of incredible transformation. And this is all to do with uh, consciousness, in my view. Um, we live in a society that will send us to prison for making use of these time-honored sacred plants to explore our own consciousness. It's surely that, the exploration and expansion of the miracle of our consciousness is the essence of what it is to be human. I would say that by, by demonizing and, and persecuting altered states of consciousness today, we could well be denying ourselves the next vital, urgently necessary step forward in our own evolution. I'm not speaking of physical evolution, I'm speaking of the evolution of our behavior as a species which governs our physical evolution to a large extent. Um, if we're to heal the planet, we, we gotta reestablish contact with spirit. Uh, and we're not gonna do that unless we first reclaim sovereignty over our own consciousness from the dead hand of the state. Um, and if we don't do that, who, who knows? We may become the next lost civilization. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. 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 You're very, you're, very, you're very kind. Now, I don't know how we're going for schedule. I have a habit of going on longer we than are, I meant to. Yes, and we wouldn't stop you. No way. So we can <laughs> either maybe... Um, I, I know that Graham is very happy to, to take talks when we do the signing, but I wonder if we want a few quick let's, notes. Let's, let's do... If, if do the, the, there's, there's two things will unfold. So let's, let's, yes. let's have some Q&A now. I, I, I would like yeah. that. Are and then if there's any time that? left... I'll sit outside. If anybody wants Magicians of the Gods, come and talk to me. I'm happy to take questions there and sign books and take pictures and whatever. Um, so, uh, anybody got a question? Yes. How do you count a non-drug way to induce these uh, states? And it could be aided by the vision. Uh, Sorry, I, have I found any non-drug way to induce these states and... Um, there are multiple non-drug ways to attain altered states of consciousness. Uh, psychedelics are curiously effective and immediate and efficient ways to induce altered states of consciousness. But the Kalahari Bushmen do a trance dance ar around a fire. Often it will last for 24 hours. And they get into a deeply altered state of consciousness, which in terms of the art that, they, that their ancestors, the sand, produced are really quite indistinguishable from, the, from psychedelic-induced uh, experiences. Meditation, uh, fasting, you know, go without food for 40 days, you're going to have visions. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways, and, and uh, it seems that some societies perhaps cut off from the visionary plants have deliberately evolved and cultivated other techniques for inducing altered states of consciousness. Uh, as to frequency and voltage, I, I'm not sure what you're getting at there, but... Uh, Tom Drew up in the uh, pop stage of Ontario where he's using pulse electron... Uh, Michael Persinger? Yeah, yes, that's right. Um, it, it's interesting. Magnetic fields do 
do affect consciousness and, and therefore we have to consider issues like the, the Fatima experience in, in, in Portugal or, or you know, Bernadette Subiru at, at um, um, uh, what's it called? Lourdes. Lourdes. <laughs> at Lourdes, excuse me, senior moment. Um, whether places affect human consciousness. Uh, I think they do. It's interesting that in medieval times, the most frequent sightings of fairies and elves were around the stone circles, you know. Maybe the stone circles affect human consciousness too. Okay, thank you. Um, yes? Uh, Fatima, uh, legal. Um, legal. I think my, what I'm most useful doing is, 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 is communicating ideas. Um, I would not wish to be involved in politics in, in any way. Um, but I, but, but, in, but, but you know, I, think, I think there is a case for, for clear communication of, of these kind of ideas, and that's what I try to, try to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll take your question right at the back there, yeah? Yeah, you, you, yes, yeah. Uh, how effective do you think um, it would be if uh, the world leaders were uh, had to take... Uh, <laughs> I'm for that. I would, I, I, again, it comes back to this question. <laughs> if, if by some, some extraordinary miracle I were given the right to make such decisions, I would require anybody running for high political office to have a dozen ayahuasca sessions first. Uh, could be a dozen DMT pipes, you know. Mm, they, would have to, they would have to go through that. I suspect a lot of them would actually not want to be politicians anymore. <laughs> and, those who, and those who did uh, would be much better, much better for us than the toxic lot we have at the moment. Um, yes. Do you believe that um, ayahuasca and DMT is much better in a ritual scenario with drums and, uh, yes. and shamans? And is there ever, ever a worry that people would just sort of do ayahuasca in their bedroom on their own? And yeah. Really not, you know, it's yeah, I wouldn't advise that. Uh, <laughs> I, I do respect the sovereignty of adults, but I wouldn't advise people to cook it up in their kitchen. I, th I think the, um, the ceremonial setting is really important. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from cultures that have worked with ayahuasca for thousands of years. Um, and, and the institution of shamanism is something we don't have in our civilization today, but it's something we need to reintroduce. We, we need to develop uh, the right way to work with ayahuasca in technological societies. And that's, and that's happening, it's being worked out, it's happening now, underground. Um, there are some very bad ceremonies being offered but there are also some very good ones. Some people are a natural gift in this area and a great sense of love and responsibility. I would say when somebody presents themselves as a shaman and you find that individual has a big ego or is building a personality cult, run a mile. Yeah. Yeah. Run a mile. The medicine is the teacher. The role of the facilitator is simply to facilitate and to protect the space uh, and, and to prevent the in intrusion of negative elements into that, into that space. So I, I'm very much in favor of ceremony. And this is something that any group of people can work out, I think, for themselves. Yeah, yes. Um, well, so, so what I've learned, what I've learned, I've just, I've just published a new book, right? Magicians of the Gods. It's got some coverage in the press. So what I, what I discovered is that there's a, there's a narrative about me, which journalists already have set. And if they're going to write an article about me, they don't actually vary from that na narrative. So the Sunday Times ran a profile of me uh, a week or two ago. When I was a journalist, which I was once, if you were going to profile somebody, one of the basic pieces of research you did was to telephone them <laughs> and speak to them. <coughs> no, they did their profile of me without speaking to me at all uh, because they already had it written, uh, which is to say that um, um, I'm a, a self-proclaimed archaeologist. I've never claimed to be an archaeologist. I don't want to be an archaeologist. I'm just a writer. I'm a reporter. I'm not an archaeologist, so how can I be a self-proclaimed archaeologist? And then the pseudo-scientist, there's lots of subtle ways 
that, uh, that are used to ridicule and diminish what I do. And I've got so used to it now that it's almost boring. There's just nothing I can do about it. It doesn't matter what I do. So I think what's great about the world today is the internet and the way it's changing and that we can communicate with communities of like-minded people face to face. We don't need the big media to mediate for us and tell us what to think. And they're becoming increasingly redundant. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. Are you aware of any plans uh, for more scientific studies of the MT of Ayahuasca? Yes. These are neurotransmitters after all, and why isn't science furiously testing those things like Strassman did? Yes. Well, no, because there is, there is work being done. As long as, you can, as long as you can say to the regulatory authorities that you are exploring some possible therapeutic outcome, it's becoming increasingly possible to get licensed to go ahead and do that research with psychedelics. But, but if you want to, as I said earlier, if you want to explore consciousness, if you want to use these as tools to examine consciousness, you're not going to get a permit to, to do that. So it's very difficult, but I do know of a number of scientists, in fact I, I sat down last week with a number of them, who are, who are developing intriguing research protocols to work particularly with DMT because it's so effective, um, and, and uh, to explore these, these very mysteries. It's, it's coming, yeah. Uh, on the topic of DMT entities, mm -hmm. I wonder what your take is. I wonder, because people have their own take <coughs> on what they are, what they mean. And they do, they yeah, are. yeah. So my last full DMT trip was in October 2011. Mm. I've had Changa since then. Okay. And Changa is a kind of gentle way to work with DMT. Mm. But the, pure, the last pure DMT that I smoked was in October 2011. <coughs> um, it followed in the same location a series of, over a couple of years, a series of DMT trips which had been wonderful, mm. filled with light and joy and healing and I, I've, I've, I became almost blasé, you know, I thought, okay, <coughs> fire up the pipe. It was Mitch Schultz actually who made DMT the spirit molecule who held the pipe for me that night. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I went into the most terrifying experience of my life. I, I mean, just, I, I'm still reeling from it. So I go, it's like something jumps out of the pipe and straight into my head and, and it's not friendly. And I, I'm, I'm in this place and it's echoing and huge and this it's hellish actually and, and, and then this voice says to me you're ours now <laughs> <laughs> my last conscious thought was shit yes but only for 12 minutes <laughs> <laughs> like, like an eternity yes those 12 minutes when I came back into the room I didn't even know what a room was I, 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 I was moving between those two realms. So it feels like a freestanding parallel realm or multiple realms inhabited by intelligences. There is something, Terence was right, there is something machine-like, something technological about them sometimes. M with ayahuasca, it's much more organic and vibrant. Um, there, is a, there is a difference, but there are places where the, the, the two ways of taking DMT intersect, I, I found. Yeah, I've met many of the entities, um, and uh, I'm intrigued by them. Uh, and and um, I love the, the statement that a number of Rick Strassman's volunteers made that entities had said to them, we're so pleased you've discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you more often, you know? Yes, absolutely. Hi there. Thank Hi. Thank you. That's a terrific idea. So you'll have it up on Kickstarter or Indiegogo? Or? Right, but the crowdfunding medium will be which? Will be on ICIS website. You know, just coming together now to make everyone aware of it. Right. Okay. I think it's a great idea. It's badly needed. Thank you. Um, 
could, could, could I somehow be informed about this when it happens? Because I would like to share that information as widely as possible. Yeah, yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And uh, I find it very uh, compelling, your idea that, um, you know, we have these um, experiences where you compare it to, like, a goddess, like mm -hmm. Athena or Venus in another realm. Yeah. And you use the analogy of a telescope looking at the stars. Mm -hmm. But to me, that seems like the same old externalization of divinity that the Abrahamic faith is called. Whereas the Gnostic view would be to say that it's a journey within, mm -hmm. and we find divinity within. Mm -hmm. Well, there were, the, the Gnostics had their aeons, you know, and the aeons were, were essentially divinities of the Plerima, uh, in, in, in my view. I think there is something external in the Gnostic, in the, in the Gnostic system. Um, I, can only, I can only report to you how I experience it. It, it, it. There is the, from time to time, for me, with ayahuasca, uh, the feeling of a, an intimate and direct contact with a powerful, very feminine figure who seems to be saying to me that her business is the planet. But somehow, every now and then, she got a little bit of time for me. <laughs> and, and, and that, the only thing I, I'm, I'm trying to use analogies, comparisons, the only thing I can compare that to is if I go into the ancient Greek situation and their, their direct face-to-face -face contact with entities that they construed to be gods, gods or goddesses, it's a bit like that. I'm not making any moral judgment about it. I'm just saying at a personal human level, that's how it feels to me. That's the best way I can... But I'm not saying that's necessarily what it is. And I remain open to the possibility that, that uh, there is no freestanding parallel realms. I, I can't prove that. That's th definitely can't prove it, but we need to do the work to find out, to find out more about it. Yeah. Perhaps these are concepts that uh, we all share because they're all within us. You know, yes. We're in contact with a really deep part of our psyche. Yeah. Yes. But then what is our, what is our psyche? What is the, the soul? You know, it, it, does it have a material substrate or is it something that's just incarnated in this form for a, for a while? We get into huge, intriguing, wonderful areas of inquiry, precisely the kind of areas of inquiry that we should be exploring as a society, and aren't at the moment. We're too busy watching reality TV and Rupert Murdoch news. Yeah. Um, yes? Yeah, okay, I'll take you first and, th and then you, yeah. I was part of a group many years ago who drank ayahuasca on a regular basis. Yes. And the group called themselves Gnostic Shamers of Light. Right. And we, and I don't know where they found them, but there were two Columbia Shamers that they found wandering through the well, I'll say just in passing that this is another intriguing phenomenon, is that we now have reverse missionary activity. <laughs> you know, it used to be Western missionaries going to the Amazon, now it's Amazonian missionaries coming to <laughs> sort us out. Yeah. So, so I, was, I was part of a group for a while, but, but there was a, a growing split between myself and a couple of others in the group because there seemed to be a paranoia and a sort of fear of being judged as prejudices. One of the group members took it to one side after Terence McKenna died and said, I had a vision and I met McKenna and Kay and he's a bad man, you shouldn't read his books. And I thought, well, that's, that's my business to decide what I feel about McKenna, not Indeed. to be told. And so eventually I left the group because I felt that there wasn't compassion at the heart of their teaching, <coughs> even though they were taking ayahuasca on a very regular basis. And then yes. eventually many of the group members moved to Colombia and lived there for many years. Mm -hmm. And then for complicated reasons, which we won't go into, I had to um, hook up with the group again a couple of years ago. And I hoped that the years of ayahuasca and the years of their experiences would have made them more open and more compassionate. But I was disappointed to find that, if anything, they were more paranoid, mm -hmm. they were homophobic, they had strong prejudices against sexuality. And I guess I had a disappointment that the regular use of ayahuasca had not opened them up to a greater sense of compassion. Right. You've got anything to say about well, I do, uh, and, and, and I think you've raised you know, an important point, which, if I may summarize it, is that all is not sweetness and light in the ayahuasca garden. Uh, there are problems, uh, some, some serious problems. I personally don't think those problems come from the medicine. I think they come from us. Uh, I think we, uh, you know, we bring baggage to the party. Uh, and that, that baggage can radically affect what happens. And where you get a group of people forming into a regular group, well, they're going to establish uh, social ideas of their own, which are put in, which may not, may, may not come from medicine. So I don't, I, don't see, you know, I don't see ayahuasca as a magic bullet. I, I see it as, as 
something that I personally have found very useful to work with. And I have encountered many others over the years who, who tell me honestly that their lives have been transformed by ayahuasca and changed for the better. So when we come across a group like the one you're discussing and their, their negativity, let's remember that there's also a lot of positivity in this picture uh, all, all around the world. It's not inevitable that ayahuasca will lead to that paranoid, judgmental group, and it's not inevitable that it'll lead to sweetness and light either. Um, in a sense, we are working with a powerful tool, and it's up to us uh, to devise the best procedures for working with it to get the best results out of it. Yeah. Um, yes? I was just got DMT as the active ingredient. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of like split out the part which is psychoactive and the way science breaks it down. Sure. And they, I find in doing so, they, they've missed the spiritual side of it. Mm -hmm. Because they're going after, okay, if you take mushrooms, you need a gram and you won't get it. Hallucinations. Yeah. I'd like to know, what is your comment? I think that's an excellent, I think that's an excellent, an excellent point. Um, and uh, in a way, it's, you know, it's summarized by the, the differences between the smoked DMT experience and the ayahuasca experience, which are the same active ingredient, but really radically different experience in, in, in many cases. I, I, I think the notion of intelligence in nature, of the whole plant, of the plant realm communicating to us through these antennae makes a lot of sense. And, it, and it's not a good idea to just look for the active ingredient, to take the ibogaine out of the iboga and stick it in a pill. Um, I, I think it's much better to do it in a holistic form in the way that it has been done in the past. Again, to learn from the human experience in the past with these, with these substances, which is very long and, and very deep. Um, yes? Yeah. Yeah. The first thing they do is to try to ridic ridicule you so that you're just dismissed. They don't have to bother with you anymore. How do you then begin to challenge the, 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 great, the great machinery? Because, for example, a room like this, I would mm. imagine most of us are, are all in sympathy, yes. in harmony. Yeah. However, we would be characterized or caricatured very negatively by the Daily Mail. Oh, you certainly would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The Daily Mail would have a field day. <laughs> yeah. Have a really, and, and the problem with new media is that it quite often is so siloed. Yeah. You know, people are following a certain group if they're into it. Yeah. And it's going to be very different to the kind of people that are following, I don't know, a far right movement sure. or whatever. Sure, sure. And how do we begin to broaden that debate and proliferate these ideas as we're one, <laughs> one step at a time. Uh, really, um, the, the f first, first of all, we just bypass the mainstream media completely because they are, they are absolutely a channel for control in, in our society. I don't enjoy plugging into it. Whenever I do, I, get, I have a horrible experience. Uh, obviously, I have publishers and they send out press releases and send things and they want to get the press coverage, but when I look at the press coverage, I'd rather not have it, <laughs> frankly. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it's horrible, There's just, but, but the only thing to do is just keep on going. Um, and and um, I find communication through the internet, people who are interested in my work come to my Facebook page, I have a lot of, my author Facebook page, I have a lot of communication there, and I find it very nourishing and very positive. I get a lot of information I don't know is sent to me by kind-hearted people who just feel I need to know it, it's great. You know, it's a two-way, it's a two-way, it's a conversation that's, that's going on. I think this is the way, the way forward, um, that we form these communities of ideas and, uh, and we are able to communicate across borders and across the old divides. That's, I, I see that as a positive thing, not without its problems. It's slow, it's a small flickering flame at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's growing. I think it's growing stronger. I think the old system is actually falling apart. It is, it is collapsing under the weight of its own stupidity. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I'll take two more questions, and then I will be happy to, to speak individually very quickly when we're at the table at the front. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a, a raise a comment of a concern I have to a room full of maybe sensible sounding ears, which is that I feel I'm nervous about ayahuasca tourism, and I feel it might be the big yeah. demonic commercial dominance entity's right. way of of blotting this out because if with with the promise of money, it can attract enough half-assed shaman to cause enough damage mm -hmm. to people, then, then the world media can kind of mobilize support mm -hmm. for a huge backlash against yeah. it. I, just like to I, think, I, I think it's a really important point, as a matter of fact. You know, this is, a, this is an adjustment that we need to make if we're going to benefit from the incredible potential and power of these visionary substances, is we need to make sure that what the scenario you've just been describing doesn't happen. And, and we, we are in a very chaotic situation in, in flux at the moment, and there are a lot of shady operators getting into the ayahuasca business purely for, for money making. And um, I'm very uncomfortable about that. And I've been at a couple of sessions in, in Britain where I've seen near disastrous things happen. Um, which we, 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 where the so-called shaman has been incompetent to hold the space uh, and incompetent to deal with the urgent needs of, of, of those who have found themselves on a very troubling visionary experience, which does happen. Um, we need competent individuals who are, who, and, and again, they, they must come from a place of love. That's very, very important as well. If it's about money, it's dangerous. Uh, so we, have a, we, ha we, we are in a situation of flux, and those of us who care about this need to do what we can to, to look after this situation and make sure that these disasters don't happen. It's going to be di very difficult, and there will be precisely the kind... There already have been incidents of the kind that you're talking about, but and they are being used in exactly the way you say. But the level of flux is also a cause for optimism, isn't it? I believe it's a cause for optimism, yeah, yeah def definitely. And I, I, have this, I have this curious um, confidence in the power of ayahuasca and the intelligence of ayahuasca, that somehow, some way, she's going to work around that. Uh, the establishment will not shut her down <coughs> and control her. This is what's going on is too powerful. I do really see it. It's mystical, but I do see it as the intelligence of the jungle reaching out at this time to literally to save the world. Yeah. One more question, which is up there. Hi. There. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, there's been so many of those. Perhaps the most memorable was in Brazil. Um, I, it was a point in my life in about 2007, 2008, where I was feeling very low. I was very down. Um, I was feeling very negative about myself um, in a bad way. And I, and, and I went for five ayahuasca sessions. And on one of those sessions, I went, I went very deep, and I found my, my whole body encoiled by a giant serpent, which had wrapped itself around me from the feet all the way around my body, and this head was resting on my shoulders and looking me in the eyes. And this was Mother Ayahuasca in her serpent form, as I construed her. And she just looked at me, and it went on and on and on. It seemed like hours, and then very crystal clear came through the message, it's okay to love yourself. Don't hate yourself. It was a beautiful moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.